Thank you everyone for showing up. Um, so this is pretty much the first time I'm talking here, and I guess my first talk for a very long time. Um, so today we're going to be talking about Spring Data REST. Uh, as Kong mentioned to you before, um, so the whole um, the whole thing of Spring Data REST uh, was a project that Kong and I worked together a couple of months ago, um, and we decided to give Spring Data a go. So we all heard about it in the team. Uh, everyone was pretty excited to try it out, but we didn't really have a way to do so due to the constraints of the project. So we decided to give it a go, like separate a few layers, give that a go, and see how it goes. And we, or at least I kind of fell in love with it, show it to Con. Con quite like it and asked me if I could present to you all um, one of these nights. And yeah, here I am. Um, I think it's pretty cool. Um, yeah, so we're going to show you how come across it that I just mentioned to you, what it provides. So we're going to go through some slides. I'm uh, actually going to go through Spring Data first and then Spring Data REST. And then at the end, we're going to show you a demo of how we can get around Spring Data REST and use that and use a few tools to, um, to see if your RESTful controllers or repositories are actually working properly. Right? So this last bit here is actually a, a reminder for me. Um, that doesn't matter how excited you get about technology, don't use that as a solution for all your problems. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, sometimes I tend to do that. So, a bit about me, uh, like beer, dev just like yourself, like beer, I love coffee, um, and I am the creator of your own Mikey app, um, just a little bit of marketing, I guess, the marketing that I get. So myself and a, other, other two guys, a designer and uh, iOS dev, we came with this idea of creating an app for people to rant about Mikey. Um, <laughs> well, it actually does a lot more than that. You can check your card balances as well on the app. You can write comments and you can spot inspectors. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, but it's, a, it's good fun. It was a good learning curve. It's out there. It had, it had about 1,200, I think almost 1,300 downloads in the last three months. We're pretty happy with it, and uh, we actually, I'm actually in the process of having top up on the app. So at least you don't have to go through the website that on your device is looking for that. Anyways, so that's me. So Spring Data. So who heard of Spring Data or who used Spring Data here? Well, OK. I should have talked more about Spring Data. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it is pretty cool. It's actually embraced all that conventional configuration stuff that we heard, I think some of us heard about before. So we don't have to write a lot of boilerplate code, which sucks really, um, and it's quick and easy to set up. You can really get a project going with minimal plumbing uh, in about 30 minutes, all right, even an hour, more or less, depending on how complicated your project is. But if you have a domain classes ready, all you really need to do uh, is just create interfaces that you picked up automatically. So that's very, very nice. And it supports all that stuff. So key value stores, JPA, graph databases, document databases. So it has a whole range of stuff that you can integrate Spring Data with. Uh, it's pretty much, you know that top layer? Well, I'm going to talk about it later on, but we usually have the three layers, the data access layer, the service layer, and the controllers, and all this stuff. So that covers all your top layer kind of thing. It's really, really cool, very easy, and quick. It's so easy, really, that all you really need is that if you have a model that says project, a domain class that says project, all you really need to do is just extend this interface and give it a name, project repository or projects repository, and that automatically will give you CRUD operations. Um, and the JPA repository actually extends the pagination and sorting as well. So you get that by default. You don't have to implement all that stuff by yourself. Everything is pretty much ready to go when the data access is laid. Um, but how, how does the Spring project pick that up? I mean, it's not simply doing that, right? You need a configuration. And that's where it is coming from. Data repositories, you actually have to use this namespace, uh, Spring JPA, Data JPA, and that will pretty much scan your, the package that you specify for your repositories. And that's pretty much it. So that will wire up everything and magically, automatically provide you a data access layer um, that you have your crude operations. You can save, update, delete, list, do all the stuff that we do on a day-to-day -day basis, right? Um, 
This is pretty cool. I think it's fantastic. It'll save me a lot of time. Um, however, we all we all been trapped by that, right? We always came across that. So we have our top layer, we have our sales layer, and we have our controllers, and that's boring. Like all the time, we have to do something like that. There's a lot of repetition going just to get the stuff that we need. Um, I've seen a lot of projects just value that more than valuing. Um, writing quality code and actually testing the code that we want simply because the architecture works this way. Um, sometimes it simply doesn't add value, right? It's just funny. Why can't we do something like that? Oops, wrong one. <laughs> there you go. Why can't we do something like that? I mean, you could just inject our repositories into our services and controllers and have our services doing more transactional operations that demand more operations using many controllers. Oh, sorry, many repositories. Um, and then just eject that into the controllers. I mean, you could, right? I mean, it's not, not a horrible pattern. I'm not saying that I hate the other one, but that's something you have flexibility to do, even with dependency injection. I mean, it's just easy to test anyways. You have a bit more flexibility. But for that matter, I mean, imagine that we're doing, let's say, an admin application or a project, a to-do application, right? Which is gonna, what I'm going to demonstrate to you later on. Usually, you're going to write a controller that will access a repository anyways to do your crude operations. Uh, save, get, list, update, delete. So why, why do we want to have that, um, accessing that, when we can have something like that, like a repository controller kind of class? Um, and to be very honest, we don't really have to write it with extreme data rest because it does the magic for us automatically. Um, Share the lot more going in the background, which I'm not going to detail here, but that's that's pretty much what it does. It gets your repos and say, okay, so I have a save operation, I have to translate that to a post HTTP. I have a delete operation, so that would be a delete HTTP. Update, put HTTP. Um, and that's and that's the power of it. You don't you don't really have to write all that stuff. However, what you do have to write is validation, but I'll get to that later. <coughs> So it's pretty data rest. So just read through the line or get some water. So that's pretty much what it does. Um, transforming or decorating your repos into controllers and exporting them as endpoints. So you could simply fire up, let's say, an application server and access those endpoints and trigger a HTTP request to them that will create the resources that you need just like if it's transporting documents across the network. It's absolutely fantastic. At least I love it. <laughs> um, so what do you get by default? Of course, that depends on which interface you inherit or extend from on the code that I showed you before. But you get crude operations by default, uh, pagination sorting, uh, batch, which I'll not pronounce because my accent is too weird, um, hypermedia as the agent of application stage. So I'll get into more detail on that later on. Um, but pretty much is using the responses that you get from your controllers as the driver for your front end or for your client. You would show you where to go next, you know, like, which is pretty cool, right? So I guess that's demo mode. Yeah, I would say. Yeah, that's it. So just gonna grab my chair. I'll go get a bit cozy, have a drink, um, and what I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna show you a little bit of this toy project that I set up. Um, it's a to-do project, has two domain classes in it, um, and uses Spring Data REST. I will not go into detail on the configuration, but I will show you how easy you can get something up and running uh, with just as few files as possible, or a few classes as possible. Right, so let's get to it. Uh, let's move this thing over here. Um, there you go. So this is available, available on GitHub, by the way. So if you want to browse the code, I'll give you the URL later. Um, so standard Maven project. We're using Maven, thank God. Maven sucks at the moment. Um, using Gradle, and with Gradle, it's just, just as easy. You actually use the Maven structure, which I quite like. Uh, what I have here is nothing more than three packages. The first one that I want to show you is that, the main project and task. I mean, how Simple to get, to get right? Um, nothing special. Three attributes plus a list. Um, 
<coughs> and we can then cascading everything, so that's pretty straightforward. Uh, also the task, same thing, so two, three attributes, and all I really need is just make them available. So how do you make them available? That, just like the repo, and that's pretty much what we have here. A repository that extends JPA repo and gets picked up by the configuration. But how does it get picked up? Well, based on that um, annotation, the data repository on the screen configuration is here. That's here, data repos based package. So it goes and scans the package and instantiates using whatever magic you use in the back end um, just to uh, provide you some controllers and repos that you can use. But really, the magic for Spring Data REST is actually here on the WebXML. So, you know, usually on the WebXML we use the dispatcher servlet. Well, with Spring Data REST, we have to use that. Repository REST export a servlet. So what, what that does is really look at your repos and export them as controllers. Simple as that. Um, and every <coughs> every action that you have on your class will be exported as an endpoint. So save, update, delete, um, and get or list will be there, will be available to you, right? Um, okay, so I have a service running in the back end. Um, here you go. So if you, this tool that I'm using is called REST Shell. If you haven't used it, use it, it's pretty cool. Great for troubleshooting. Um, so what do I have here? So I have the service pin out. No data in the database yet. So what I'm going to try to do, I'll just try to do a list. So the list with REST shell will do a get on the server and try to tell, and will tell me what resources are available from each query. So do that. Here you go, I have projects and tasks. Right, that's pretty cool. So what can I do? Well, I can go follow projects. And here I am now, so I have, I'm on that context projects, and I can do a get here, and what would that do? That will consult the server and tell me, okay, please get me everything for projects. So it's very straightforward, but it returns some stuff. Things key, content key, and page key. So when I mention page by default, that's what it gets. So you have the size, the limit of that page, total elements, total page, and the page number that you're at. Yes, sorry, this is a new question. Um, what, this is some sort of record. Uh, okay, so what's actually doing here? No, no, like what, what, sh what, what program are you running? Oh, REST, REST shell. shell. REST shell. Yeah, on the terminal. Yeah. I can, yeah, I can talk about more of that later. Yeah. So, it's just, a, it's just an application server that's already running in the background. Yeah. And it's just doing, you can see that get HTTP, put that in the browser, and it can do it to it that way. Yeah, so, so what? When I spin up the server, what do I actually need? Look, look at my repos and say, okay, so I have a project and a task repo. You, if you looked at the code, you saw that you actually, actually had a, you had a project repository and a task repository. Because I'm actually looking at the package level here, you export everything that's available under the package. Right. So when I do a get, there's nothing more than a HTTP get and brings me that. So I don't have anything on that yet. Um, so let me add some stuff. Uh, get. So I'm going to add the most. I'm going to go add that stuff here. I'm going to post just a project without tasks and I do that. So this is all valid down there, right? Here you go. I got a 201. I mean, how easy <laughs> could that get, right? It's pretty straightforward. And if I do a get again, hey, there he is. Um, now I have some stuff populated, some actually stuff going on here. You can see my attributes, name and due date. Um, you can also see a relationship to self, which means I can go to this URL and get more properties if they're available, want to don't have any. Um, and relationships. So this link page is, is actually the cool part of it because it provides that's what the whole hypermedia as stage, blah, 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 that horrible word, um, just do for us. And actually, the results drive you 
to the next page. Oh, where, where can I go next? Oh, I can go to that. Or I can go to self. And that's pretty cool. If you, if you build a client around it, it's very easy to navigate to the next steps and find out what's available to the client. Um, but, I mean, what if I submit a new job without the due date? I mean, I don't have any validation on it, right? So it should just accept, and it does. And it kind of sucks, because I want you to have a due date, right? You don't want to create project without due date. I mean, it doesn't make sense. It just go forever. Um, so, but the data is available, it just doesn't have a due date. So the due date is actually, it's not there, right? It just hides from there. But now I have a page with two elements and a limit of 20. So I'll get more into pagination later on. Um, right, so let's, let me stop the server and add some validation to it. With Spring Data REST, you can add validation very easily. I had a validator going on here initially. Um, with Spring Data REST, you have to implement the validator interface, which kind of suck, really, because that's, that's what the official documentation says. You cannot use the valid annotations on, on your models, simply because you don't have access to the repository or to the controller, to the repository controller that is being instantiated for you. So they say implement a validator and do all your validate here. So that's why I have these horrible methods, this horrible thing going on here. Um, which, I mean, does the job, right? And uh, you at least provide me some JSON back as well that I can play with and display that to the client. Um, so that's pretty cool. So how do, do I wire that up? Yeah. Couldn't you still use the annotation-based validation in here? Like wire in a, a, an annotation-based validator? Uh, here. Oh, yeah, well, you could, apparently. You can, but I just didn't get to it. Right. <laughs> the, documentation, the documentation says to implement a validator, just like that. So I didn't go into more detail to identify what more can get from it. You can, um, you can extend the repository, um, the controller that actually does the exporting for you, uh, and then do some fancy stuff in there. But I just, yeah, just didn't bother right now. Yeah. All right, so validation. <clears throat> if I, so what I need to do to wire this validator on, I have to go into here and simply tell Spring Data to, hey, can you pick up that validator for me and execute that before I save something, right? <coughs> so. This is a manual way of doing it, and there's this other way as well, which you can wire up specific classes, just like that. Uh, but you have to have a specific name before it, so action that's supposed to do. So before save, before update, um, after save, and things like that. So this is what it provides for you. Um, and you can, you can do all sorts of validation that you want, or even do some decent logic that's not, not ideal, really. But you, you can do some stuff on it, it's pretty cool. Um, why do I have these repositories export inside my meta in Spring Data REST? Because that's where the default configuration looks for it. We can override, um, but we have to have something inside the meta in. That's just the way it wires things up. Right, so now I have my body data here. What I'm going to do, I'm going to start the thing again. <coughs> Here we go. All right, so my validation does nothing more than three things. I cannot submit a project without a name. I cannot submit a project without a due date. And I cannot submit a date that's in the past. So if I go back to my REST shell, and try to do that, right? I do do that. I got a 400, and that's really what to expect, right? Not a 500 or not a 503 kind of thing, but something that tells you, hey, there's something wrong with your post, and that's what's wrong with it. And that's really good. At, I really like the way it just presents the information for you. So it's an array of errors, so you can map that to specific stuff. Um, same thing 
if I uh, put, let's say, I have a date as well, or due date, and that is in the past, so I'm going to put last month, and submit that. There you go, that should be in the future. Um, and that's and that's pretty cool. I mean, you can you can achieve a lot with a little code, right? I have what I don't know, about 100 lines of code in total on <laughs> this project. I mean, and get this thing going. It's it's really fast and it's kind of fun as well. You see the results quite quickly. Very straightforward. Easy to the bug and needs to get moving. So what else do I have? Um, so, yeah, so I'm just going to go show a little bit more, also a bit more data on it. So you can, when you do a get, oops, get, I, because I restarted, I don't have any data, so I have, so when you do a get, get, I can actually go and do a delete one as well. That would go and move my gun. There you go, true or false. So true or false is a success response, but there's no content coming back, which is pretty cool. So if I do a get again, hey, where is it? It's gone, right? Uh, same thing if I do a post again, same data. Um, and I want to update just the date, right? It's quite like that. <laughs> Um, so if I go due date, uh, it's not actually next month, so I want that to be towards the end of the month, like towards the end of the days. <laughs> um, I can simply do that, and oh, look at that, I got something wrong. <coughs> oh, thanks. What am I doing wrong? Post. 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 No, I have my document. Project, Project names in the validator. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's... Not the way I remember doing it. Ah, uh, and uh, hey, that's what works. Anyways, <laughs> that was my bad. Sorry, uh, but really, really, what you get is two or four. What? Try that. Yeah. 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 Nah, nah, because there's no project. Yeah, look, that, that's all right. This is my shot. Sorry. My bad. So, basically, to do so that. And, yeah, so there you go. Um, so, I'm just going to put some other stuff in here. Actually, before I do that, I'm going to enable something else. So with Spring Data, you can also do searches. So you can go into a repo and say, hey, um, I want to find my name. Right? I want you to simply go and say, OK, please provide me a method so I can search by name. And that would be like a like query on SQL. Um, the one thing that we have to do for Spring Data REST is really provide the param name that we're going to provide to, the, to this method that gets exported. Uh, so we can say, hey, my name will be equals Tarsio, for instance. So everything that contains Tarsio will be then searching the database. So it does the binding between your HTTP URI and the method that you're actually populating when you're invoking this, the, the parameter that you're actually populating when you're invoking this method. We're going to do that. Uh, we start my Jetty. It's, that's the best thing with Java, isn't it? Um, Here we go. And the same. Now we are. Which 
go. Cool. Thank you. So what are the four trigger requests? So I'm just going to come here and we post all this data there. Look carefully, uh, you see that I'm actually submitting some passes as well. So it's because I'm cascading the data. Um, here we go. So when I do a get project, uh, you see that now I have five elements, and I can simply say param limit limit equals one. And what that will do, that will invoke, let me invoke the method again, but you see that now I have total elements of five, and total phases of five. Now, with the hypermedia as a stage of your application, blah, 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 you see that here at the top, it gives me the next page as well. It tells me, hey, if you want to access the next page, you can simply invoke that. So you can append that to your, to your results and say, okay, so once you get next page, so just go and do project page two, limit equal one. And limit equals two, and that will give me three pages and so on. So you can navigate across and go to different resources and so on. It's, uh, it's pretty cool, but another thing that provides me here at the top is that, projects.search. So that's a new thing, right? So if I go to follow projects.search, and do a get, you see that that method that we added to the project repo is actually exported here. So we can invoke it, and that will give me results according to what the method supports. So that was a find by name containing. So that's a like query with percentages on both ends. Pretty cool, very effective. Um, so you can simply go follow find by name Companion. Companion. Here we go. And there you are, and there you are, right? And you can do get minus minus params and name. What is it? What did I do? Oh, God. So we're just going to use O and figure that. And dash will provide me everything that contains the letter O on the name. So project, work, house. Um, just like a like like query, very straightforward. Um, it yeah, it doesn't provide me though the uh, the pagination on that, um, but it's yeah it's pretty good already. Um, just given that out of the box, uh, doesn't ha you don't have to list through all the stuff. It gives everything and uh, all the results so you can move on with it. Um, is it is it possible using just the rest to find out what Using the REST. Just using the... Uh, well, with REST shell, um, when I do... Whoops, up, what am I doing? <laughs> so, <laughs> list. So, when you do that, with Spring Data, right, what it works, it works, it works by convention or actually discoverability, right? What happens is, when you do find by name containing, um, I actually had that to show you. <laughs> when you do find by name containing, it's a spring data thing, then that will translate the method find into a function that will execute a query based on the attributes that you provide on the name of the method. So when I say find by name, it's actually finding by the name property of my project class all the time. Uh, so when you say that, you actually, you cannot compile your code because Spring Data and the whole Java thing will tell you, hey, you have to provide a parameter to that method, otherwise you won't be able to use it. So this is the Spring Data documentation. 
And if you see here, these are the keywords that you find when you string data. So you can do things like, if you have a property called first name, you can do find by first name like. And that automatically will translate that into a, into a SQL query that contains the like string. As far as I remember, at the start, yeah, whatever you provide, yeah, like that. Uh, same thing with starting with, um, not now, ending with containing and so on. So I'm using that to wrap my parameter into that. Um, just to give an idea, so if I want to search for, uh, coming back here, and I want to create a new thing that's a list project, uh, find, so find by, do, right, and just say that, so, um, do, and that will give you uh, a base object, that will give you a date, so you can, work with it. and, and that will create the query for you, doing that due date equals the date that you provide. That's pretty much the query that's going to generate. And that's automatically, I mean, you can, you can of course create your own queries. You could do something like, no, I don't want you to do that. I want that to, to go query, and then you provide the query that you want. So you can give a query name, and you can give a native query, or a count query, or blah, 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 or the query that you really want, like a JPQL query. It's pretty cool. I think it's pretty powerful, honestly. Yeah? So, I guess the following on from the question, um, it, it uses a discoverable, it sounds yeah. that it represents a discoverable endpoint, but I think the question is, given that endpoint, how do you discover what parameters? Yeah. So yeah. It's not like supporting, say, the Hubble standard in the, in the representation of return. So, how can I find that that endpoint actually requires the main parameter? You're, yeah, you're absolutely right. It doesn't option to uh, you can do an option request if you use a servlet tree, um, but I'm not at <laughs> the moment, I'm just using 2.5. But yes, you can do an options request. I'm not entirely sure if you return the parameters that you can invoke. Um, but yeah, I guess I don't really have an answer for that, to be honest. I don't think the REST exporter will actually tell you what sort of parameters are expected or the name of parameters, because I could call name as like Tarsio. You know, that could be the parameter name and the value, whatever value you give to it. Um, but yeah, it's a good point, you can investigate that, let you know, yeah. Cool, all right. Um, I guess that's pretty much it. Um, like, going back here, come back here. So, as I said, it's pretty cool. It's not a solution for everything. Um, I think it works pretty well for small projects or things like you have full control of the UI and you know exactly where you're going from next. Uh, unfortunately, for some more complicated apps, you may need some service layer, may have to export the service layer, maybe create controllers that will work with the service layer. But uh, one thing that I found is that these can be very tough to follow, even if you are a client play application that relies on that most of the time. Sometimes you need to deviate from the path a little bit. Uh, so that can be a challenge in itself. But it's nice that by default you get that. Uh, at least you don't have to implement all this pagination sorting thing because it's already there for you. Um, validation can be cumbersome, I think. Um, all right on validations yourself. I mean, you do that to create a class and that would be nicely laid out in different separation of concerns and so on, different annotations. But it's, I just think that writing one class for that just feels a little bit weird. Of course, you could come up with better patterns for it. Um, yeah, and you're not full control of the repository controller. That's something that Spring Database provides for you. You can extend it, and you can do your own thing to it, but that's really up to you. I don't think that that depends on your implementation. So if you want to do fancy stuff, uh, maybe Spring Data REST is not for you, but Spring Data will save a lot of time, that's for sure. Um, so some resources and tools. So REST Shell, that's what I've been using. I think it's pretty cool for troubleshooting. Um, absolutely fantastic. I came across this book the other day. Um, it does quite a lot of good work. Just explaining to you what Spring Data is, um, how you can wire stuff up, and how you can stop writing the data access layer and just let it take care of that for you. 
uh, documentation for the rest. And Postman is um, is a um, Chrome extension, absolutely fantastic. Uh, we use that for uh, debugging as well on HTTP requests. So if you've never heard of it, it's really really good. Um, and yeah, I guess that's it. So if you want to keep in touch? There's the presentation at the bottom. Uh, there's the GitHub, my GitHub. So the project is in there. Just feel free to browse it. Um, yeah, just hit me up on Twitter or LinkedIn, and we go. Oh no! Oh yeah, that fa I failed to mention that. So I not relate to Spring at all. <laughs> I just like Spring Data, and Spring Data is not my own thing. Yeah. Uh, it's just Sorry, something. Spring Data Rest. No, it's not my own thing either. Yeah. Okay, yeah. No, it's not my thing. That. No. So that's just your own app. Uh, yeah, I just create that as a prototype because okay. you know the other one, they actually provide one so you can play with and investigate and see how you can do some more advanced stuff. But I just thought, well, might as well just create something simple. Uh, they at least we illustrate the concept, and then moving from that, uh, you guys can do your own search, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Um, yeah. Authorization? Nah, nah, didn't get to that. Yeah. But I mean, it's a Spring, right? You could use the Spring off package and just no, swipe. Oh. <laughs> nah, nah, I didn't, I didn't get to that level of wiring some other Spring components on that. Um, giving, look, the way I used to do authentication, very simple, having a user detail service, and that will inject the uh, Spring data repo into it anyways. So you could do that, but yeah, I didn't get to that level. Uh, what representation do you support out of that? Uh, Jason. Just this? Just Jason. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, disappoint you. <laughs> yeah. What is that YAML loader? The what, sir? Oh, that, ah, oh, yeah, okay, so YAML loader. So, so I had, you guys familiar with Play Framework? Yeah, okay. So Play Framework, you, you can inject some initial data when you're starting up the app using YAML format, and I really like that. So, so I thought, well, might as well just Look at it and see if I have something similar for Java. Well, we actually had something out of the box called Snake YAML for Java, and I just implemented this YAML loader that takes the file and pushes that to the database, pretty much. Yeah, very simple, stupid code that I wrote five minutes, so that's pretty cool. I mean, at least to get some data set up to, sh to actually show everyone, but I end up not running that, so at the end of the day, I'll just run pull requests. So yeah, it became irrelevant. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay, I'll answer the second question first, and I'm going to have to repeat the first. <laughs> um, so the second question is, um, uh, from what I have been listening or been participating in some projects, people have been loving more this conventional configuration thing because you have to do so little um, and don't have to write boilerplate code, which at the end of the day just convolutes your code base. With Spring Data, all you really need is just an interface and one line on configuration, and that will do all the stuff for you. Um, the project that I was working on with Con, we decided to go ahead with it because it was, like, was a brand new project to start with. Um, and we had the chance to explore some of the stuff and the results were actually pretty good. Um, I have seen some other people looking at Spring Data as a solution over the DAOs um, and having that just being implemented as a separate package and being distributed along because it can be very, very small jar file that can be distributed in different applications. So it's a better idea to DAO. Oh, yeah. Well, it's, well, it's DDD, right? The DAO, it's it focused on that free service layer kind of thing, which we still implement every now and again, even using the repo terms. Um, yeah, so to me, I just see that's a solution to, uh, yeah, get rid of the boilerplate code, just use that. That would pretty much fix the life kind of thing. Okay. No, you didn't listen to that. <laughs> I didn't say that. <laughs> yeah, and the first question was? Oh. 
Oh, okay, fair enough. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Uh, with the errors response, like um, you were showing the validation values before, mm -hmm. is there any way to get it to associate the error message with the actual field? Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah I don't necessarily didn't get too far on it. Um, because what it, what it really takes is, where's my validator? No, that's not what I want. Um, so, this, yeah, so the errors response will actually take, that depends on the validator uh, implementation that you do, because the validator interface provides this error, so this error object, which you can reject the value on that field. Yeah. But interesting enough, we didn't really push that back to, uh, to JSON. So I'm not gonna show what actually does the background, to be honest, but that's, when you specify that, that, and that, that's, yeah, that's the field that's going to um, But you're actually specifying, okay, this field's failing, hey, this is the message associated with it. Yeah. But the JSON didn't come back, I don't know why. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Oh, oh. Jeez, uh, yeah. I know. So I guess your application has to support this, you know, in terms of that, you know, the uh, service layer gives you back the methods that you can call upon your different uh, objects. That's what, what the concept is behind it? Well, so that you can call a, what, um, a next on a coordination. Yeah, look, the, the way I see it is if, you, if you're using Spring Data RESTful, I'm assuming that you're actually building an API or a RESTful API, yeah. right? And that will provide you the methods to navigate through your resources using the API to get, let's say, the next page of results or to get that representation of the object that you want. Yeah. So that's great for it. So really, who, who will drive, like, who will drive where you go next is the API. But how you're gonna use those results depends on the client. Yeah. It's not like you, cre you create a service layer to access that stuff and then export that, because at the end of the day, you actually be writing controllers accessing services, and not you not having controllers like repository controllers, and you'll be creating an API that's not really like it's dependent on you to design, and not exactly on Spring Data. Yeah, so I don't understand like, yeah. if your application doesn't support that. Can you can you lead it away? Oh yeah. Uh, say, no, don't, don't, uh, nah, uh, no. I think that rests by default. Nah, you can't. Yeah, because but it's it's what it's built uh, upon really. It's the concept behind it. So they use I hate POAs, whatever, uh, as the concept behind it to build Spring Data REST. So you can't really check it out. But the whole thing will crumble. <laughs> <coughs> yeah. So you've got two. Yeah. Uh, so you have one project to mo two domain classes. Yeah. 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 If, if you get something. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So if you have, let's say, if you have an inner class, let's say on your project, um, and this inner class is called address for whatever reason or manager. Um, that will come back in the response, really, and to the default response. You don't have to do another request to it. But from, uh, I was trying to find out reading the documentation to see if you could configure the response back to say, yeah, I want you, I, like if you didn't notice on the response, it actually doesn't return the ID. That it's the re because it gives you a self relationship. So you don't have the ID property here, although I actually have that. On my on my project class, um, so if there's a way to configure that, well, I couldn't find it. I read through the configuration, I read some, uh, brought some code, some other examples, and I couldn't find anywhere that you could tweak that and say, hey, give me that, or don't give me that so kind of thing. Yeah, because that's a collection, and you're accessing another resource that's exported. Yeah. Um, I think depending on your GPA mapping, yeah, I would say so. 
Um, but being a collection, I don't think you could embed that as an array on a response straight away. Because the concept of HTOs is assuming that, okay, you just need access to that resource now. If you need more information, just go there, kind of thing. And it seems like that, that's probably not a true collection like At some point, you're going to have to like, P value pairs or properties or something like that. That's right. That's right. Like, yeah. No, you're absolutely right. Yeah, one thing that you could do, um, you could use the embeddable annotation into a list, and that would probably be displayed as, as an array. But again, I haven't tried, so don't want to, you know, <laughs> kind of thing. Yeah. Have you compared this to projects um, that use, say, Jersey um, uh, to do the same sort of representational state transfer? Yeah. I never heard of Jersey. Uh, no. So there are other projects that do something similar, but they don't use Spring Data, they do provide a RESTful interface. Okay. Um, and with that, you can configure different representational pieces for the default one, like that. And there's others where you can then annotate which parts of the attributes are exposed and okay. which ones are not exposed. Right. And also to manipulate the links collection, because that's something you're going to want to do very quickly. That would be pretty cool. Yeah, no, yeah, could investigate that. I Really, never played it. Um, yeah, in the other stuff. No questions? No? All right. Oh, that's it for me. Thanks, guys. Now, um, before you go away, just um, uh, still here. Still here. <laughs> um, we've got, we're able to give away two IntelliJ licenses tonight, so. Um, has anyone uh, has anyone not got a card? Well, you want to speak? Yeah, fair enough. Sure. All right. Sure. All right. One. And um, not two. that one. Click back. Oh. <laughs> All right, so we have that. Ten of spades. Here you go. Clubs. Um, <laughs> Sorry, I don't play cards, as you can see. <laughs> and we have ace diamonds. Yeah. Close enough. Oh. Here you go. That's it. Nice one. Yeah. So does it, no one has the sign of that? No. Clubs. Clubs. You got clubs? Is it hey, clubs? look at that. Well done. It's now 10 o'clock. <laughs> cool. All right. Cool. That's Thank it. That's it. All right. <laughs> cool. Thank um, you. Cool. Thanks. There's um, still some beers in the fridge and some pizza if you stick, want to stick around. Otherwise, thank you for coming and uh, we'll see you next month. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.